ब्रह्मानंदम परमसुखदम केवलम ज्ञान मूर्तिम द्वंद्वातीतम गगन सदृशम तत्वम अस्यादि लक्ष्यम एकम नित्यम विमलम अचलम सर्वधी साक्षीभूतम भावातीतम त्रिगुण रहितम सद्गुरुम तम नमामि सद्गुरुम तम नमामि सद्गुरुम तम नमामि This is my favorite verse from Guru Gita. I bow to that Guru who is the joy of Brahman, the permanent, everlasting, overwhelming joy of Brahman, Brahmanandam, Paramasukhadam, grantor of the highest state of well-being, Kevalam, in Kaivalya, in solitary. Jnana Murtim of the form of pure knowledge. Dwandvatitam, gone beyond all the dualities. Gagana Sadrasham, like the infinite sky. Tattvam, uh, tattvam Asi Adi Laksham, the original experiential meaning of the phrase Tattvam Asi. Ekam, singular. Nityam, eternal. Vimalam, immaculate. Achalam, unmoving. Sarvadhi Sakshi Bhutam, the very being of the witness of, of all intelligence. Bhavatitam, gone beyond all moods and emotions. Triguna Rahitam, the three gunas washed off. I bow to that guru. Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Someone requested. Uh, to hear that, I had sung it several times in the other workshops. My friend Ananda Bhavnani was kind enough to give me a melody for it. Today we're going to talk about uh, pranayama in the Yoga Sutras. So it's a little bit of an academic lecture, I suppose. I'll try not to torture Chu too much. 
No poetry. <laughs> we have, in various contexts over the last several weeks, talked about Sutra 34 in the Samadhipada, the Chapter 1. Pracharna Vidharanabhyam Va Pranasya which describes the process of breath awareness. Most of the traditional commentators interpret this as a sutra about pranayama. And if you see a new if you see a new translation of the sutras, turn to that sutra and see if that's what the author says about the meaning of the sutra. And if it is, throw away the book. Even most of the traditional commentators get this wrong. Because they are scholars and philosophers and not really practitioners at a deep level in yoga. There are three commentators whose experience you can rely on. Four, if you count Swami Veda. The great commentary of Vyasa. From the sixth century. And in the tradition, Vyasa and Patanjali are read as one author. Then we have Bhojaraja or Bhojadeva. Who was a king, a poet, um, a great supporter of the arts and also a great yogi. A great yogi. Lived in the 11th century. And then we have Hariharananda Aranya in the 19th and 20th century. A really interesting guy. And at the end of his life, for the last, I don't know, maybe 20 years, something like that, he lived in a cave in the middle of his ashram. Interacting with his disciples for just a few minutes each day. And in that cave, he went through all the experiments of yoga. So especially for the parts of the commentary that remain unfinished in Swami Veda's work, we rely on Aranya's work. And one of the rules of sutra literature is that you don't repeat yourself. <laughs> and for the sake of keeping the sutras as brief as possible, you don't use synonyms. Mm -hmm. 
And this becomes important when we look at uh, several of the sutras. Patanjali's sutras on pranayama are 49 through, I think it's 54, in uh, the Sadhana Pada, chapter 2. So 134 can't be about pranayama because he talks about pranayama in a different place in the text. And he uses different terms. So Sutra 134 describes basically the same practices of breath awareness that are used in the Buddhist tradition, identical. In Pali, Panapanasati. In Sanskrit, Prana Apana Anusmriti. They even use the same words. So that's Sutra 134. And that's how to tell if somebody knows what they're talking about about the Yoga Sutras. And then we have Sutras 31, I think it's 31 and 32. Hmm? 31. Yeah, 31 and 32 in uh, um, the Samadhipada. I'll just have to look up the sutras on my handy Yoga Sutras app. <laughs> there is a, There is an app for that. Sutra 30 describes a whole bunch of obstacles to meditation. Uh, these are called antarayas or vikshepa. And this word vikshepa is close to the word vikshipta for the kind of mind field that you and I have. A little disturbed, but we can concentrate some. And this list of obstacles in Sutra 30 are you can also consider to be an additional list of kleshas to the ones in the sadhana pada. Now, in Sutra 31, as Yehi was saying, it gets interesting. Here, Patanjali is talking about the problems that come with those obstacles to meditation. There are five. Dukkha, pain and suffering. Dawar manasya, which just means bad-mindedness. I think in modern terminology we can read anxiety and depression. Anga mejayatwa, unsteadiness of the limbs. Anga 
该要找自己在嗯可能静坐的过程中会有的这样子不自体的一种身体的。And shvasa prashvasa, breathing out and breathing in. These are the illnesses that accompany the vikshepas. Patanjali is saying that breathing out and breathing in is a mental illness. Seriously. Does that sound weird? <laughs> Now the terms that are used here are shwasa and prashwasa. And these are ordinary, commonplace Sanskrit words for exhalation and inhalation. The words for exhaling and inhaling are different in pranayama, right? Some of you, some of you remember those words. I know you do. What are they? Puraka, rechaka, right? And actually, potential uses some slightly different terminology than that,、uh, also. So, what's the difference? What's the difference between shwasa and prashwasa and puraka and rechaka? Awareness, absolutely, mindful awareness. That's what makes the difference between breathing being a mental illness. And breathing being a way into samadhi. And that's the difference between regular breathing and pranayama. The word is composed of a compound word composed of two words, prana and ayama. Prana, of course, is the subtle energy. And somebody sent me a question the other day by email to see if we could track down the etymology of the term prana, and you can't, which is really weird. I'm going to have to get myself a Paninian grammarian to、uh, take this word apart. <laughs> I'm going to have to get myself a Paninian grammarian, a word me- a word mechanic. <laughs> I'm going to have to get a mechanic to take this word apart,、uh, and, and because because the grammar of Panini is a mathematical system. It's it's not just a system of rules about words. It's the it's the science of thought in the ancient world. So it's a very highly developed discipline. In fact, the grammar of Panini is the world's first computer program. It was written in 600 BC. First computer program. If you load it on a PC, it will run. 
been done. So prana we don't know the origin of at the moment. <laughs> Ayama has two meanings. It comes from the root yam, which means to control. But its other meaning that it gets as a result of that prefix is to expand. And that's the more important meaning and the more subtle one. And the one that we're going to talk the most about. So, as I said, the, the uh, sutras on pranayama begin with Sutra 49 in the Sadhanapada, Chapter 2. The uh, sutra says, when that posture has been accomplished, Breaking the force and uncontrolled movement of inhalation and exhalation, is termed breath control and expansion of prana. Breath control and the expansion of prana. Remember that, it's on both of the tests. <laughs> breaking the uncontrolled movement of the breath, and breaking here means putting on the brakes, not smashing. Breaking the uncontrolled movement of the breath is control of the breath and expansion of prana. We're, that, that's coming. Control and breath and expansion of prana. He says in the commentary, sipping the external air is in breath, shwasa. Sipping the air outside into the body is an in-breath, or shwasa. Expelling the air inside the body is out-breath, prashwasa. Breaking their force, in other words, slowing them down, and uncontrolled movement after the mastery over posture has been accomplished. Yeah, it's complex. Um, slowing them down and and, and controlling their uncontrolled movement after the mastery of posture has been accomplished.
and thereby the absence of both, meaning shvasa and prashvasa, is called pranayama in terms of breath control and expansion of prana. So here he's really discussing uh, this distinction between mind be, between unmindful breath and mindful breath, between pathological breathing and meditative breathing. There are so many ways in which uh, breathing is involved with all kinds of pathological process. Both in the sense of ordinary psychosomatic illness but also in terms of the difficulties we have with all of the disturbance in our mind. All of the pauses, for example, in your breath are holes in your awareness that allow all kinds of random thoughts and emotions to leak into your mind. Eliminate the jerks and pauses and your concentration will be unbroken. Because, because so long as the breath remains unbroken, the mind cannot shift its object of concentration. The uh, mastery of posture as a prerequisite for pranayama has some importance. And at some point I recommend that you, that you read these sutras in chapter 2. They're, they're really quite interesting. And here we need to make a little bit of a distinction between pranayama as it's known in the Hatha Yoga tradition and pranayama as it's known in the Dhyana Yoga, the meditative yoga tradition. The exercises in the Hatha Yoga tradition have a lot of huffing and puffing. And a lot of troubling your nose one way and another. To a Dhyana Yogi, these are simply preparations. The real pranayama begins when you have accomplished total stillness of the body. <coughs> which allows you to have total stillness in the breath. 
And once again, this is not holding still. It's becoming stillness itself in your whole mind. So there's no effort in it. You just settle into it. And these uh, dhyana yoga practices of pranayama are mostly done in Shavasana. And in that way, they're fundamentally different from most of the exercises we know from the Hatha Yoga tradition. And Sutra 50, Patanjali goes on. That pranayama is divided into three modes. External, internal, and suspension. Observed by location, the place of awareness and concentration in the body. Observed by the by where you observe it and, and where you concentrate on it in the body. For example, between your navel and your nostrils. Also by duration and count, by how long the breath becomes. It is made long and subtle. And that is the goal of pranayama in the meditative practice of it. Dirga and sukshma are the two Sanskrit terms that you'll hear over and over again. Long and subtle. And again, I'm not, I'm not going to go into the details in the commentary because there's not only a lot of details in the commentary, but there's a whole appendix about this whole issue of how you measure the breath by counting. And uh, we don't need to go into that right now. It involves learning a whole language of timing that we're not uh, familiar with. But the important point for us now in this sutra is the goal of making the breath long and subtle. Sutra 51 says the fourth pranayama is that which surpasses the ones that operate in the exterior and interior realms, meaning exhaling and inhaling. And this also refers to retention inside and retention outside of the breath. (laughs) 
So Vyasa in the commentary, I won't, I won't read through the commentary verbatim because it's also very complex and I think we can make the point without it. Um, I'll just, the concluding sentence here, the fourth pranayama consisting of the cessation of movement of both is arrived at. He's talking about the spontaneous suspension of breath that we call kevala kumbhaka. This is another phenomenon that occurs when the breath has become sufficiently long and subtle. You'll be sitting there in your meditation and suddenly the question will arise in your mind, am I breathing? And if you watch carefully, you'll either find that your breath is very long and subtle, almost imperceptible, or it may actually have stopped. And when it stops, you know, usually if you, you know, shut off your nostrils, after about 30 seconds it gets a little uncomfortable. After a minute, you really want to breathe. minute and a half, you start turning blue. <laughs> when the Kevala Kumbhaka occurs, there is no anxiety about ever taking a breath again. Now sometimes people see that this has happened. And they say, oh my God, I should be breathing. And they, and they start to actually create some anxiety about it. But if it really is Kevala Kumbhaka and you settle down, That anxiety will go away. And you just enjoy that state for as long as you can. Because this is one of the gateways into the deeper states of meditation. It takes a bit of emotional purification for this to occur. So if it does come to you, you know that you've done something. And this also, this also touches the issue about pauses, the, the pause in the breath between exhalation and inhalation. Many texts recommend focusing on the pause between exhaling and inhaling. And an awful lot of teachers do this as well. There is a secret here. The secret is they're not talking about the ordinary pause between exhaling and inhaling. inhaling. That's pathological. Mm-hmm. 
According to Swami Rama, that, that is your death, he said. It's this spontaneous cessation of breath that these texts are talking about. That's what you concentrate on. It's the spontaneous suspension of breath, the Kevala Kumbhaka, that you concentrate on. As I've said before, secrets in yoga are not about hidden information. They're about things that come in your meditation that you don't understand without having had a certain experience. And so I often tell the story about getting into a fight with a big teacher of Mahamudra meditation in the Tibetan tradition who happened to be teaching at a workshop in hypnosis that I was attending about this issue. He was recommending focusing on the pause and the breath. And I put my hand up and said that, you know, in our meditation tradition, our masters are telling us to eliminate that pause. He said, don't do that causes psychosis, causes people to go crazy. So I almost got into a fight with him about it, because it's really clear in our tradition. And I thought about it all day. And finally in the afternoon, the light bulb went on. And I realized that there's a difference, just as with the posture, there's a difference between trying to force something to happen and simply letting go and holding your awareness steady and allowing something to happen. That sounds like a very fine distinction, but it's really a very important one. In Swami Rama's language, it's the difference between your death and your enlightenment. So when the Kevala Kumbhaka comes, wallow in it. <laughs> Enjoy it for as long as you can. And it will take you somewhere. The next sutra... Well, because if you, if you manage to master that pause, then you decide when you leave the body. And the way that works is that a body, the life of a body is not counted in years. It's counted in the number of breaths that you have when you're born. And a breath is counted from pause to pause. Uh, 
So as long as it's pauseless, no matter how many exhalations and inhalations you have, it's one breath. And this is how you get these yogis who have extremely long lives. Swami Rama's master was 161 years when he left his body. Born in 1820, left his body in 1881. 1820. No, left his body in 1981. That's when he was born. And so this is this is one way that they live such long lives. It isn't quite immortality. But it's pretty good. The average human breathes 15 times a minute. If you cut that by half, and that's not so hard to do, you add about 18 years to your life. In Swami Veda's case, he added about probably 20, 20, 25 years. With the severity of the type one diabetes and heart disease that he had, most people die in their late fifties, early sixties. And he was eighty-one. So my astrologer says I got seventeen more years. Let's see what happens. <laughs> so, Sutra fifty-two. Thereby, he says, in other words, by practicing these pranayamas, making the breath long and subtle, and especially experiencing this higher、uh, suspension of breath in the Kevala Kumbhaka, thereby the veil over the illumination. Diminishes and vanishes. Hmm.、Um, the veil over illumination diminishes and vanishes. Um, yeah, the beginning of that process. <coughs> This is talking about the dawning of prajna, of transcendent wisdom. And what、uh, Vyasa says about it here. Is this illumination veiling act, in other words, the normal activity of the mind? Tied to the sanskaras, is weakened through the practice of pranayama. And 
and diminishes moment by moment. And this knowledge is, as I said, prajna, the transcendent wisdom. But it's also the knowledge of the distinction between prakriti and purusha. And the word for this is viveka, khyati, discriminative wisdom, which is used throughout Patanjali. The word is in Sanskrit is viveka, khyati. Khyati, discriminative wisdom. Of the difference between prakriti and purusha. And then in uh, Sutra 53, he says, through pranayama, there also develops the capacity. for holding a focus in the matter of practicing concentrations, dharanas. And this is how the mind field is gradually made sthiti. still and pacified. This is, this sutra describes the end of the process of citta prasadana, of making the mind clear and pleasant. Because then your mind can settle on a concentration in that effortless way. And concentration becomes natural. The next uh, Sutra 54 actually is a description of Pratyahara. So this is something that happens also when the breath becomes sufficiently long and subtle. When the senses cease conjunction, cease interacting, with their objects. They become assimilated with the mind field's nature. In other words, they dissolve back into the mind. And that is called pratyahara. So, for example, in many of our longer subtle body practices, particularly the 61 point exercise and Shitali Karana, the breath often becomes very long and subtle. And all of a sudden, your mind flips inside. And 
And when I'm teaching these practices, every time somebody will ask me, I was aware inside, but I lost contact with the outside, was I sleeping? And the answer is no, because you were obviously aware of what was going on. You were experiencing some pratyahara. And if you lead these practices with other people, of course, the practice is always deeper when you share it with other people. You may find yourself going into pratyahara. And that can be really annoying. <laughs> Especially in 61 points. <laughs> well, where was I? <laughs> Did I get that last fingertip? <laughs> or was I just thinking about it inside? I hope you have that problem. <laughs> because it means you're getting somewhere with leading the exercise. It's one of the risks that comes along with this process we talk about of always leading a practice, whether it's a pranayama practice or a relaxation practice or an asana practice, from an internal mental practice. So you're not instructing people. You're doing a practice and you're reporting to people what you're doing. And when you can do that, then you really transmit that state to your students directly. I actually got through all the sutras. I'm amazed. It's just after nine. So let's uh, take a couple of questions. Michael? Asked me an either or question, so the answer is yes. <laughs> he asked me an either or question, so the answer is yes. <laughs> it's observing both. Observing the physical breath as a way to begin to become sensitive to prana itself. And one of the reasons why the air stops moving in cable Akumbak is that you no longer need air to carry prana into your mind, into your, your mind-body system. It's a sign that your mind has established a direct connection with prana. Mm -hmm. 
And as long as that connection remains intact, you don't need to breathe. Um, Swami Rama, in his Path of Fire and Light, talks about practices of kumbhaka that go on for 8 hours, 12 hours, 20 hours. And you can't do that by holding your breath. So that's a, kind of a long answer, but good enough for now? <laughs> okay. Yeah, Tanya. Can Baka happen after inhalation or after exhalation? Can happen either way. Yeah, I mean, and gradually, it, it's not even something that you control with a sense of effort. You control it by continually relaxing and letting go and letting go and letting go and continuing to observe mindfully. And if you do that, then gradually the, the breath will self-correct um, and it will gradually become smoother to the point where eventually it becomes pauseless. That it's not something you need to put a lot of effort into except to relax. We live in such an action-oriented world, it's really hard for us to let go. But that's one of the main refinements of breath awareness. Remember that little sutra of Swami Rama. Just, just refine your breath awareness. All of this will come to you. Okay. And it just feels sometimes on this path that it it just feels like this eternal loop. Like, yes, it's an inverse relationship, but it just, sometimes I just feel like I'm yo-yoing back and forth and I'm not really making... It's not the veiling that weakens the sanskaras. It's the pranayama that destroys the veiling over the light. It eliminates the veiling of the light. The veiling of the light by the disturbances in your mind. Right, so it's like... Yes. But to be able to get to a point of really doing pranayama, you have to emotionally purify. It almost feels like this. Do you know what I mean? Well, you sort of do both things at once. It's kind of it's a little bit of a paradox, yes. A paradox just means that you're at the end of what you know. And you need an experience that helps you to know in a different way. So if you just let go, it'll come. <laughs>
，但是你同时又需要申请他们的公司，才有办法做到持续的情况。那这样子的话，是假设没有一个投缘的问，然后老师说，基本上，嗯，在逻辑上来说，暂时没有做，可是是因为你还没有经历到这样的事件，所以只要放下去练习，你就会发现不一样的一个高度。So let's conclude there and give a hand to our very hardworking translators. <laughs> Nicely done.